Let's say good morning to the House Majority Leader, Eric Halsoder. E, good morning to you, sir. Good morning, Rob. And it sounds like you've got a great crew in there. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's been fun. <laughs> We're not yeah. going to solve too many Scooby-Doo mysteries. I'll tell you that right now. I'm going to sell that van oh, we have wow. out front. Uh, yeah. Eric, so uh, you texted me after a conversation we had with Seth DiStefano earlier in the week right. about, from the West Virginia right. Budget and Policy Council when Bill said, where is the surplus money being spent specifically? And at that point, you sent to me a document uh, for uh, the state's budget, and that included an explanation as well as to how to find where the surplus money was being spent. So you take it from here, sir. Yeah, and, and it was a great segment. I listened to what Seth, and unfortunately I had to listen later in the evening when I got home because nothing more annoying to listen when you're in an attic working and you're hearing somebody, you know, talk <laughs> about numbers. And, you know, it's hot and you're just, okay, whatever. I got you, bro. So, but no, later, yeah, later that afternoon I listened to it. And it was a great segment, and uh, you guys did a great job. And Bill brought up, I believe, uh, hey, no one knows where the surplus is. Because you, you hear so many times, in fact, Rob, you stated uh, truthfully on, on, on the air that we may have a $1.8 to $1.9 billion surplus. And that is true. And we're right now we're at $1.5. But for your listeners, I want you to remember, of that $1.5 billion surplus that we're at already, the legislature has already accounted for $1.1 billion, it's like $1 billion, $165 million worth of spending in the fiscal year 24 budget bill that we just passed. It's House Bill 2024. So in theory, when we finish the end of the year, we're only going to have maybe $700 million, maybe $800 million left for whatever we want to spend at some future point or to carry forward to the next budget cycle. But just to answer Bill's question and to answer some of your listeners' questions, I'll go down through this list. There's like 28 items, and it's going to be like it's going to be pretty dry. But I'll just read through them real quick and stop me at any time. But uh, item number 398, the very first, um, and this all can be found in the budget bill. It's under Section Nine, Appropriations from General Revenue Surplus. So the first item is DNR. It's for capital outlays, repairs, and equipment, $52,900,000. The second item is Department of Transportation, $10 million for secondary road maintenance. Then item number three, Department of Tourism, $15 million. Item number four, $282 million, and it's for uh, deferred maintenance at our state colleges or universities and CTC and deferred maintenance at our state correctional units. So that's $282 million. Uh, we, uh, in item 402, the fifth, the fifth item, Division of Culture and History, $2.2 million. Uh, SBA got $40, $40 million for school construction fund. Uh, item 404, the seventh item, Higher Education Policy Commission, a new, uh, to help support nursing program. There's a nursing shortage, $20 million. Uh, this next item, item 405, Jobs and Hope. That's a program that the governor started uh, when he first came into office. And it was allocated $1.6 million. Uh, the West Virginia Conservation Agency for the Soil Conservation Projects and Dam Repair, $21,060,000. There's uh, some federal dollars attached where we can draw down another $50,000, $60,000,000 uh, dam repair throughout the state. Um, let's see here. Item number 10, Department of Economic Development, uh, $38 million for Site Readiness Program. Uh, item 408, the 11th item, uh, Department of Administration for capital outlay, uh, repairs and equipment for the Holly Grove Mansion. That was allocated $5 million. Uh, Department of Economic Development, the West Virginia EDA Credit Insurance Fund. It was allocated $37,200,000. Uh, the Governor's Civil Contingent Fund, item 410, $500,000. Department of Homeland Security, 800000 <clears throat> Excuse me. The uh, Adjutant General's Office, four million seven hundred eighteen thousand. Of that, three million three hundred eighteen thousand went to the Armory Board, and one point four million went to the Civil Air Patrol. And then we have a Division of Health, item sixteen, uh, and that was for EMS salary enhancement of ten million dollars. And then uh, item four fourteen, which is the seventeenth item on the list. And altogether, there's twenty eight items, but uh, this is another program from the Governor Jobs. For West Virginia graduates, 
$1 million. That's something that he spoke about at his State of the State. Uh, item 415, the Division of Multimodal Transportation Facilities, the Aeronautics Commission, they were allocated $1 million. Uh, item 416, the 19th item on the list, Division of Health, $2 million for the Hardy County Health Department. Uh, item 417, Department of Administration, Office of Technology, 500000 Item 418, the number 21 item on the list, West Virginia Schools for the Deaf and Blind, $500,000. And then the big one, item number 419, the 22nd item on the list, it's the Personal Income Tax Reserve Fund. We socked away $400 million in case something were to go awry, so we have that in this Personal Income Tax Reserve Fund to backfill if there's any problems. Uh, item 420, Division of General Services. Uh, the legislature has thought that they should consolidate all of, all, excuse me, all of the state laboratories, so we allocated $125 million, and this would uh, consolidate the West Virginia State Police, the Department of Agriculture, and the Department of Health and Human Resources all together in one building, and uh, we believe there's some efficiencies where we can save some money there. Uh, item 421, the West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine uh, received $29 million for a new uh, building on their campus. A WVU uh, received $50 million for a National Cancer Institute. Uh, item 423, the 26th item, is Division of Culture and History for 500000 and that's some educational enhancements. Uh, item 424, this was uh, something that the governor spoke about at his state of the state. It's the Posey Perry Emergency Food Bank and it was allocated $10 million. And the last, last item on the list, another governor program, uh, it's called the Communities and Schools. That was allocated $5 million. All total, $1,165,478,000 of this surplus that you keep hearing about is already being spent. And, Does that make sense? And the other projected seven to $800 million, Eric? And it has not been decided on. So if the governor decides to call a special session in uh, July or August, most likely probably August, because we have what's called the 13th month, it allows them to reconcile all of the accounts to, to figure out exactly what is uh, true and, and, and reflect the correct number. And at that time, you could see money being spent for correctional volunteer fire department i mean you name it it's whatever is on the minds and the will of the body of the legislature so you know it's very possible that we could have a special session but it's also uh the governor could elect not to have a special session and carry that money because that, that 700 or 800 million that would be remaining is general revenue unappropriated and all that means is next year next january when the session begins that money will just be absorbed into the governor's new budget and that, that general revenue unappropriated, and there you go. Whatever he decides to spend it on, of course, it's up to the legislature to make the final decisions because the legislature appropriates the money, but uh, that's the whole process. But I just wanted to give your listeners a quick rundown. You keep hearing about these huge surplus, but remember, $1.1 billion of that surplus has already been spent. No, Eric, let me ask you the mechanics of that $1.1 billion already being spent. Is uh, uh, is the line items? Are these uh, figures based on budget requests that were made at the beginning of the session, but because of a flatline budget, they couldn't be accommodated? So you're just kind of going around the bend and giving it to them in the uh, kind of a backdoor way here, or are these issues that came up later on along the way, and you decided they were good ideas to fund? Uh, both. Some were issues that there's been uh, several talks were, uh, with the consolidation of the state labs. Uh, so, you know, it's about a $125 million hit. Okay, so when you start to see uh, a surplus, uh, remember, it's all one-time money, so there's no ongoing expense unless you decide to make it a salary enhancement. Uh, then it becomes a an ongoing expense. So you try to use your surpluses just for one time. Uh, spending requirements that doesn't have any future impact to the budget. 
sometimes that's possible and sometimes it's not. Bill. Yeah, Eric, I think I understand, but you're much quicker with numbers than I am. Uh, you've uh, you've mentioned several that, w- that the money would be going to. There's still mm-hmm. some, some money left over, is there not, after, uh, uh, let's say we get $1.8 billion and all the accounts that you just mentioned. There, is there still around $700 million left over? Yes, there will be about $700 million, and then that's at the will and uh, discretion of the legislature and the governor. Obviously, everybody's going to be jockeying for that money. Outside interest groups are going to be jockeying for that money. You're going to hear more and more uh, people ramp up, hey, we need this funding, we need that funding, and it just becomes yeah. you know, everybody's jockeying for that that amount of money there's money on the table so to speak and that's a that's the area that i would like to kind of uh, mine down or, or drill down a little bit on and i've been in government for a lot of my life i fully appreciate the the pressure at the end of the year of if you can get money or if you have money you're going to spend it gum hell of high water uh so what's the what's the discipline what's the protocol uh that do you give as much scrutiny to to projects within the 700 million as say you would do some of the other projects you or you just mentioned or is it kind of a rush that will come to agreement and we'll start funding well it's a whole funding process bill because you have some people that will say hey look we need more money in secondary road maintenance you, you'll have uh, uh, some people say, hey, look, we need to pay our correctional officers more. You'll have another group that say, hey, look, volunteer fire departments need more money. So that's the pressure. And sometimes some of them rise to the top and, and you get buy-in. But uh, that whole process, it's just it's simply what it's called. It's a process. And sometimes you, you may allocate a little less dollars to one. You may try to equally distribute uh, all of the money. But uh, I suspect from the growing contingency of, of complaints that I'm hearing, it will probably be something in corrections. Now, what that will look at, I have no idea. Uh, I don't believe it's just money that needs to be thrown at the table. Uh, I've had several conversations with Rob and others that, hey, look, just right up the road, you know, in Maryland, they're paying their correctional officers five, six times more than what we're paying, and they still have the same issues with retention, just trying to get, you know, correctional officers to work. So obviously there needs to be some type of structural changes. What those structural changes are right now, I have no idea. But uh, we do have several groups, uh, committees that are working on that, and uh, that's to be decided. Now, we'll have to wait and see. You know, you've, you've heard the governor, governor several times say, hey, look, I've sent up two bills. One of them involves locality pay. I would agree of the or five major correctional facilities. You've got three in the Eastern Panhandle that desperately need more money, and you've got one in the Potomac Highlands out in Augusta that also needs more money. But in itself, is this an opportunity for us to get localities paid? Maybe. Uh, I just read an article on Metro News uh, just yesterday or day before yesterday where Dale Lee was talking about, I think, teacher pay is like 49th in the nation, and, you know, he advocated locality pay. Uh, It's something that we've been advocating for for years now in the Eastern Panhandle, but we just can't get it across the finish line. But uh, this might this might be the year. Yeah. Uh, Eric, first, I want to thank you and uh, congratulate you for uh, for being able to uh, spell out so clearly uh, a a question which we had the other day. So I very much appreciate it. Also, uh, Rob provides a form to do that. Uh, I'm not sure every place has this this luxury of a, a question will budget. Well, don't forget, disaster. Bill, you've got a phenomenal delegate sitting right across from you that knows all this data. Uh, you're exactly right, Eric. And I sh- and I it's my fault. I, I was looking right at him, and I grew a blank. Bill's still mad at him for solving that success journal clue That's so right, quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Hike. Yeah, Mike Hike, he did a great job this year. Good job this year, Mike. Well, thank you, Eric. I appreciate that. Um, and, and even though you have a lot of faith in me, I don't know that I know the numbers like you know the Impressive. numbers. Impressive. Um, and, and just for everybody's sake, uh, 
talk a little bit about where those um, decisions are initiated. Are they initiated at the governor's office and he sort of decides where and how much um, this this back of the budget money is going to be spent and then it comes over to the legislature and we either approve or disapprove or, or increase or lower that amount. Is that how it works? Yes, yes, and yes. So You'll have uh, pet things that the governor is interested in. One of those things could be correctional pay raise. Uh, so the governor will, the governor and the governor's staff will talk with the key leadership positions, usually the speaker and the Senate president. And then from that, they will go out before their caucus. Obviously, the speaker will say, okay, I like to have a, a phone caucus where eight, all 88 or 89 of us are online. They'll say, okay, here's the issue. You know, we're going to see 700 million. The governor's proposing this. You know, maybe 300 million for this. Uh, what's the flavor? What's your thoughts? You know, and both houses try to get feedback back to the governor if it's a go or a no go, or yes, it's a go, but we want these changes. And that's how the whole process works. How much of it is initiated by the legislature, either the House or the Senate, that that goes to the governor and say, we would like to see this amount of money spent in this area um, and push through in that regard? A lot more often than what you think, because uh, this time the governor is taking a little bit more of a hands-off approach with the correctional uh, pay raise because he has stated several times, hey, I've sent two bills up. It's now for the legislature. The legislature is trying to throw the ball back into his court because the correctional pay raise is a, a uh, I don't know the word that I'm looking for, but it is part of the executive's requirement. Uh, you know, we allocate, we appropriate X amount of dollars for each and every one of these agencies. It's up to the CEO or, the, in our case, the governor uh, to make sure that those dollars are spent. If they need to pay salaries, that's fine. If they need deferred maintenance, whatever they need, they have the flexibility. Obviously, uh, they do sometimes need to get uh, what's called spending authority. Sometimes they will have funds that have excess dollars in it from uh, it could be a special fee or a tax that was raised. As that money comes into the account, the legislature gives that spending authority up to a certain dollar amount. If they want to spend more, they have to come back to us. We have to grant them spending authority. Or we could say, hey, no, we want you to spend this money in this direction. So it's up to the legislature. We appropriate the money. We have 100 percent control no matter what decision is made by the governor. So let's talk a little bit about um, the flatline budget. And it it yeah. seems to me that um, there has been an effort over the past four or five years by the legislature to hold, and, and even the governor, to hold the line on a flatline budget in an effort to get um, – PIT, personal income tax reduction. And that was a, a reality this past session. Um, and we, we didn't want to do any base building because that was the goal. And now that we've right. reached that goal and we still see some surpluses on the back end, can you see some base building going forward, maybe in the area of corrections or, or other areas where we have sort of ignored or kicked the can down the road um, in, in an effort to get to our, our ultimate goal of, of tax reform? Well, and I want to talk real quickly about the budget process, because we do get hung up on surpluses. We get hung up on the word revenue estimates. We hear stories where the governor might have set the revenue estimates too low. But keep in mind, the budget process, it's a budget. It's a future outlook of what you think your revenues are going to come in. Now, can you predict them exactly right? Well, eh, you get them fairly close, possibly, based on historic trends. But here's something that your listeners need to realize, because the argument that I keep hearing a lot of times is, well, the revenue estimates are so low. This is why the legislature has this huge surplus. So let's just assume, for uh, illustration here, that this $1.1 billion was actually thrown in. That Let's just assume that the governor said, in reality, the legislature, because this budget that we just passed was like $4.8 billion, this 
fiscal year 2024 budget. Let's just assume that the governor did include, and there were and there weren't any uh, surpluses, and the actual budget was 5.9 billion. So here's the problem that the governor, the CEO, as you start this budget cycle in July 1 of this year, as you go six months into the budget cycle and you're not meeting those revenues, what people don't realize, then the governor has to make an executive decision. The governor could do across-the-board cuts to reduce spending. So the whole budget process, it's, it's a little bit of a roadmap. You're, you're trying to get your target revenues as closely as possible. But, uh, and again, if you're a smaller government type of guy like me and yourself, you want to say, hey, look, let, let's limit the growth in government. Because remember, the growth of government, we were seeing growth of 5 6% per year, okay? And once that money gets put into what I call the black hole, the budget, then it's a lot harder to get out of it because there's some social program that you or I or someone else may not agree to. And it's much harder to get that money out because, remember, once it's in the bu- budget, the legislature is going to spend it. And uh, so the whole budget process, I, I know it's, you know, everybody wants to see the revenues come in exactly, but that's not how it works. And if they don't come in, the governor is forced to do a mid-year cut. And then if the revenues don't come in, then we could draw from the rainy day fund. Or the next option, obviously, is to find a tax. So those are the three options that the governor has at his discretion if the revenue estimates don't come in as planned. And Does that make sense? Yeah. During the 13 years I've hosted this show, Eric, we have seen, one, the rate of the rainy day fund to help balance a budget, and mm-hmm. two, uh, a shortfall of funds during a budget year which required a tax increase vote. Mm-hmm. If I remember, I think yep. it was on cigarettes and a few other things yeah. or whatever to try to raise revenues to make up for that shortfall. So we have seen these things in very recent times. That's right. And remember, whenever the governor produce, uh, uh, hands us a budget or produces it, and it has total spending of $5.9 billion, the legislature at any time can decide, no, we only want to spend $3 billion, or we only want to spend $4 billion. Some of the things that I've talked about several times on this station is, and, and I think it's desperately needed, we need to have a whole budget process rework. I keep saying we need to sit down as as the legislature and decide what are the priorities. Is it Department of Health? Is it education or this or that or this or that? And, and find out what are the priorities and then fund those priorities instead of just funding all things. And then here we are. We have deferred maintenance projects that's been for the last 20 years, you know, at some of our higher institutions, you know, or, or our correctional units. You know, some of these uh, deferred maintenance projects go back 10, 15, 20 years that they haven't done any work at. Uh, So, you know, I I think we need to sit down as the legislature and decide what the priorities are and then advocate for spending for those areas and just do a whole revamp of our of our uh, budget process. Allow the legislature to set the revenue. You you have time for another question from Bill? Sure. Yeah, sure. It's, going, it's going to change the subject. Uh, Bonnie and I were driving around yesterday. We noticed a lot of these new buildings, uh, uh, distribution center or warehouse storage. It brought to question how, what taxes they generate. Obviously, they generate property tax. But using Macy's, for example, if I order something from Macy's distribution center, I pay a tax when it's received. Do they also yeah. pay an income tax in addition to what those products that I, that I pay a tax on? Yeah, they're paying a corporate income tax, but keep in mind Macy's itself to get to, to attract them to the area. Uh, you know, the county and the state issued a pallet agreement to attract Macy's. Yeah, a payment in lieu of taxes. But uh, yes, Macy's is paying corporate income tax. That's the other. You know, you hear that argument: businesses aren't paying you know, yeah. tax. No. They're, they're paying a corporate income tax. Yeah, the pilot agreements generally are with uh, personal pro- uh, property tax and not so much yeah. income tax. Uh, okay. and, and the other thing that I heard on your segment the other day was about, you know, the teacher pay and, and correctional officer pay. And, and I think I think it was Rob who brought up, hey, uh, if you want to compare yourself to Maryland or Virginia, then obviously your tax base has to increase. Well, either your tax base has to increase or you've got to be willing to pay more in taxes. So – property taxes is what's funding our schools in West Virginia. And if you asked 
people, would they be willing to pay more in property taxes? I think you already know what the answer is. You know what I mean? Next month, so. I'm about to write a check for over five grand to cover my property taxes, E. There you go. There you go. Yes. Yeah. So... But anyway. I, I started to cry as I said that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Got a little tear in my eye, a lump in my throat. Eric, anything else, man? Final word is yours. No, that's it. That's it. Good good job. Keep up the good work, and uh, don't cut my uh, height any slack here today. <laughs> never do. Never do, man. Never do. <laughs> Thanks, boss. All right. See you guys. Bye-bye, Eric. Delegate Eric Halsoder, House Majority Leader.